The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning all, I hope you're all well and uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, this webinar is on rescue plan for working at height, which is for, um, for, for working with MUPES. Um, hope you all had a good bank holiday. Um, weather was a bit disappointing, but I guess that's uh, uh, bank holidays in, in the UK for us. We've, we've kind of been spoiled. This webinar is live, um, so, um, so if there's any grumblings or any uh, um, sort of um, you know, issues that perhaps happen with the IT world, Please don't shoot me because I'm not an IT uh, IT guru. Some familiar names joining me today on the on this webinar. So thanks for your continued support. It is appreciated. Um, for those who are joining us today for the very first time, uh, my name is Brian Parker. Um, I am the business development um, manager, technical support for the AFI group of companies, um, and I'll be taking you through this webinar. That's probably going to last around about sort of uh, 40. Uh, 45 to 50 minutes um, and then at the end of that webinar there'll be a short term um, Q&A for anybody who, asks, who, who, who perhaps wants to ask any questions. Now questions are freely allowed to be asked during the webinar. Um, unfortunately you're all on mute because um, um, it's a bit of a nightmare if everybody's speaking um, but what happens is if you can see the question box there if you've got a question that you want to be um, you know to ask me then you know you know type your question in there uh, and I'll endeavour to try and answer that question throughout the webinar. Anything that I can't answer um, during the webinar due to time constraints, because I appreciate you're all busy people, then I will endeavour to uh, to do that after the webinar, uh, albeit privately. OK, so let's move on. Um, so a little bit about myself. You know, I'm not going to uh, take up too much time here. I think pretty much one of my roles is really to, to, to get involved with the industry. Um, and as you can see that from the IPAF side of things, um, the the um, HAE, um, uh, Tools, Plant and Equipment, and I've recently been appointed as the as a board member and the PASMA Training Committee Chairman uh, also been recently appointed. Um, so, you know, really sort of embedded within that. For my, for my sins, um, you know, I'm involved with quite a lot of these um, IPAF groups, which of course is a lot of the working groups, which will be, you know, some of the guidance that you're going to, uh, you know, we're going to, I'm going to look at a little bit later on. Um, and I did eight years in the, in the forces and the Royal Engineers. So I was a plant operator at that time. I've been an instructor naturally for, for some period of time, um, tutor and such. Um, so, uh, you know, appreciate you know, that, that, that side of things is, and I've not done it for some years, they've moved on. Um, and, you know, and things are, you know, things are improving at all times during, during, um, you know, various sort of courses that we've got in, we, you know, we look at just a little bit about today, um, agenda, Quite easily, we're going to look through some guidance, a bit of competence and, and what around training, and then really get to the, 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 the crux of why we need rescue plans and some of the issues that surround that and perhaps some of the sort of stigmas and some of the things that you can, you know, they're out there to help you. Um, and look, you know, finally, a, a bit of a hierarchy towards the latter part of the um, the webinar. Um, as I say, any questions or anything that you've got, you know, please ask, please, uh, you know, ask, ask away as necessary. OK, so obviously today we're talking about MUPS. Um, I will touch on other sort of aspects of working at height, but you know clearly we're a you know we're a new company um, predominantly training. Um, so you know again just bear in mind that this predominantly is for aimed for mupes, but you know could apply the same sort of logic to some of the other uh, other areas. Okay, um, before I move on, I'm just going to ask a, a question uh, on, on, on a poll, uh, and what I want to do is just uh, get you to a little bit in, involved here. Um, so. Where where would you um, just what what need you to do now is to click on one of them them options. Where would you find the information to prepare the machine specific rescue plan? All right. So what I, what you can't see is what I can see now is um, the collating responses. I mean, maths ain't that great, but um, I can I can add up to a hundred. So that tells me as well if you're uh, um, attentive during the during the presentation. Um, and you know, essentially, you know, which way people are voting. Um, 
a membrane of course today this is about to help you know this is to help you and this is to help to support you and give you some inclination as to you know as to what um you know you know which way you should be going okay so i'm going to close that poll that's been running for 50 seconds that's sufficient okay so happy with happy with the responses there um the main part where you're going to find um information specific to a machine's rescue plan is predominantly always going to be the operator's manual all right so you refer to the operator's manual that's going to give you information specific to that machine and bearing in mind i think last count what i looked at um on one of the sort of recent surveys there's probably between 55 and 58,000 MUPS in the UK, um, of which that there's got to be thousands of different types, uh, models, makes and such. So it is imperative that you always refer to the operator's manual um, to ensure that, you know, you're getting the current machine. And just be mindful as well that manufacturers will, you know, they will update things. Um, I'm pleased to see, you know, 22% of you have clicked on there in terms of familiarization films. I'll cover that a little bit later on. Um, they are available now. We offer them freely available for the industry. Um, we, you know, to my knowledge, and I've not been told any different yet, we're the only rental company who's made these available from a mute perspective. Um, so in terms of that, you know, they're there to help and support you. Okay, I'm just going to ask you another question there, um, and this is really important, and I, and I need you to sort of answer this one as, as, as what as what you uh, what you think. There's only two answers here. So from the ground position, which is normally the quickest way to lower the platform. Okay, quite an easy one that. Um, so I'll close that there. All right, so the quickest way is normally the ground controls. Okay, the ground controls are generally speaking powered into the into the machine. Auxiliary tends to rely upon a battery or a gravity uh, type uh, device to get the machine back down. Um, normally what I would encourage you to do is, however, is to use your auxiliary controls to um, uh, essentially bring the machine out of the area closest to maybe where it is up to maybe a wall or a beam or a structure so use the auxiliary controls which are you're going to get a lot more finer control but then once you've cleared of that then you're going to use your ground controls and that's going to get the machine uh, down to the ground position uh, quick quicker than the auxiliary controls all right um question here for you um where is the operator's manual normally located Now, one thing I haven't asked on here is how many of you are MUPE operators? How many of you got experience of MUPEs? Because I'll tell you now from the amount of people that's registered on the webinar, um, they're not just from the UK. They are from different countries. And you can tell that by the, um, the um, um, you know, the email that comes through to us. So um, so essentially, there's, there's varying, varying people. Um, but in terms of the, the operator's manual, um, it is going to be key to whatever you're going to be using. I've already identified that. Um, and without it, you're going to be, you know, you know, struggling and to, 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 to work out, you know, where and how and, and how the machine works. OK, so I'll close that then one there. Um, and in terms of that, um, I can see there that 60 um, percent, 67 percent of you opted for a, for a box in the platform, um, which is which is correct. 10% um, opted for box on the chassis, which is also correct. So there are some some machines where the manual is located in the base on the, on the chassis. But again, finding that manual is sometimes a challenge. Um, in terms of box on the control panel, ground control panel, um, again, the the odd one. So there's no right or wrong there. All right, I'm testing what you what you know in there. And to be fair, I, if I, if I took the word normally, 67% of you will be right. Normally it is in the platform, um, and that's key for when we're where you know, it's always good to have a great plan. All right, but when that plan is reliant upon you know you're looking at that operator's manual, um, and that operator's manual is 100 foot up in the air, and you really you really are sort of up against uh, in between a rock and a hard place in terms of how to get that machine back down. So you know don't rely on that. Um, yes, we can download them. Yes, we can have them on tablets. But the you know the uh, the reality is when something does go wrong, you need to have access to that um, that that manual very very quickly. All right, and last but not least, this one here. Now, how long does it normally take you to prepare 
your mute rescue plan. Now, this might be appropriate for some of you in the audience today. It may well not be. Um, but if you know, and, I, and I'm hoping it's not just a copy and paste here. Um, but in terms of, you know, how does it how long does it take you to pre prepare it? I've heard varying things in, in, in the past and, and, and people have said to me, you know, it takes me hours and hours and hours to prepare. And I'm thinking, you know, what level of detail are you going into it? What what type of, um, you know, what type of um, information are you putting on that rescue plan? OK, do you know, this poll is probably the closest poll that there's been yet. And, and to be fair, um, you're all jumping about there, but um, I have red, green and blue lights going up and down. Um, but you essentially, you're, you're more or less there. Um, insofar as the fact that you all you've all kind of gone straight down the middle in terms of, you know, some of you believe that it's 10 to 20 minutes. Some of you think it's 20 to 30 minutes and some of you think that it's 30 or, or, or longer. Um, so that's great. OK, right. Well, thank you for that. It's just important that we, we do them sort of things just to give you a bit of an insight as to what I'm going to go through today. OK, um, in terms of guidance, then. Um, there's, you know, when using any MUP, the primary consideration for any MUP and all MUP operations is a safe return to ground level of any occupants that's inside the platform. And generally considered when we look at this, we're, we're often thinking of the machine under its own motive power and, of course, in a controlled and safe manner. There are, however, unexpected events that mean sometimes the platform and occupants are prevented from lowering the platform to the ground. And I'm going to cover that a little bit later on. Now, what happens and, you know, if we can stand there and, and, and you know, and think, you know, uh, you know, have we done everything that we've done or should have done? Have we covered everything that we, we ought to have sort of covered? But at the end of the day, often it's da it's down to the capability of the person at the ground and their competence. And it may be a question of putting into practice any rescue plan that you may have prepared and bringing the occupants down. Now, the last poll that I did there, um, you were kind of more or less. Uh, all kind of agreeing that you know you kind of uh, 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 you know across the three areas so some may have put too too little information some might have hit it on the nail some perhaps may have put too much on there and it's got to be you know it's got to be workable it's got to be um you know um, practiced it's got to be actually understandable now unfortunately there are many examples of rescue uh, rescue from people uh, of people sorry from the platform around our industry and it highlights that it's often uh, more often a frantic and chaotic pushing of buttons and toggle switches, which can affect, unfortunately, lead to, to more issues or injuries to occupants in the platform. You know, if I take that middle picture there where the guy's in the steelwork, if he's now up against the steelwork and I'm reliant on somebody on the ground to get me down, I'm hopeful that that person on the ground is going to operate the right control to release me from that piece of, of, of metalwork or, or whatever it is I'm against. You know, failure to, to, to press the button or toggle switch in the correct way can have a huge effect on the rest of my life. So there's a myriad of guidance out there. You've got to consider it. Um, and some of you may be guilty of not knowing, you know, where to start and, you know, and, and of course, where to stop. Have I done enough? Now, fear not. You know, the guidance is fairly straightforward, relatively easy to apply. And if anything, and I'll say this, you know, the main issue that you will have is the location and different types of ground controls, features, and emergency loan systems, which are fitted to MUPS. Now, I will state this more than once today, and I know there are manufacturers listening to this presentation today. Manufacturers do a fantastic job, build fantastic kit, get the, get the machines up to the air, hats off to them. But they do design, position um, their ground and auxiliary and emergency loan controls in different places and knowledge of these you know and rehearsal prior to using a mute is paramount to any safe rescue okay so in terms of further guidance too um there are again the strategic foreign plant safety group which is a which is um a cpa type uh, construction plant I association group they've done loads of guidance on you know for example medical fitness managing this, the condition of, of mobile uh, elevated working platforms competence ground conditions now i've done um, a webinar in the past on ground conditions and i've also done a webinar uh, on the past on managing the safe uh, condition of mobile elevated working platforms they're in our bank of, of webinars you're free to actually go on there uh, and down, you know, and, and download them and, and listen to them if you've got any doubts about a few areas. Also, as well, there is um, avoiding trapping, crushing injuries to people in the platform. Um, and again, in terms of, of of that, that great, 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 great information in that document. I want to cover that a little bit later on, um, which also covers some secondary guarding aspects as well. And also, you know, again, 
the MUP safety group, who are part of the strategic form and plan safety group, have put into get put into place a MUP sort of safety alert protocol. So there's loads of guidance out there um, that you can uh, you can uh, you know get your head into and, and making sure that you know, you understand what's what. So let's just set the scene. Okay, it's a normal day, all right, um, but then things turn badly very very quickly. Um, now I hope that none of you have been working at height thinking how I'm going to get you know how I'm going to get down. Um, you know, because if, if I'm going to take a machine up, I need to know how I can get the thing down. Um, and that might not be me that gets the, the machine down. It may be somebody on the ground. The reality is, though, many people work at height every day, not even thinking how they would get down. Why? Well, it's simple. It's basically because they don't think that anything's going to happen to them. Now, they may well have attended briefings on mute safety, toolbox talks. They've had rescue plans. They've been told to carry out a rescue practice. But, you know, let's face it, perhaps they attended that toolbox talk or that briefing because they had to simple if you don't attend it you're not working on the site um it'd be interesting though you know a quick straw poll how many of you have actually ever been on on a, on a job and you've known of somebody who's had an, a rescue situation or you know, need, needed to get back down so training of mup operators is not often carried out on the mute that they're going to use i'm not going to say that's always the case sometimes they do actually use the machines that they're going to use that's typically when you're using the machines on site but if you sent your people and your, and your operators and, and your would-be operators to a training center often they're trained on something that's not you know perhaps like this machine that you can see on, on the screen there so it could be days it could be weeks or months until that trained operator actually uses the mup the MOOP arrives, it's twice the size of the thing that he was trained on, it's got different safety systems, different features, you know, and there could be nagging doubts and fear of failure in that operator's mind. So let's think about this. Have you ever been in a situation where you yourself have been uncertain or disagreed with what's been said, but not actually spoken up because no one else has? Well, I know I have, you know, so yeah, I'm sat at a briefing, somebody's telling me something, I don't, dis I disagree with it and I keep still, I don't say anything. Uh, and why? Because we keep that, you know, perhaps that insecurity of coming across as stupid or perhaps worried what others may think. And there's a fear of being outcast or singled, uh, singled out for asking, you know, what would amount to a question that you should have known. You're, after all, you're the trained MUP operator, you're the expert. So we when we're faced with the risk of looking stupid or saying something what others may not like, we often chase this, you know, choose a safe option and we stay quiet. As, a, as a, a manager or a supervisor in charge, or indeed if you're the MUP operator, you may have the responsibility of showing a ground re rescue person how to lower the machine in the case of an emergency, or you may have the responsibility of making sure that that process has been done. Training and competence. Um, training should follow a, a you know fairly uh, um, associated task with the machine. So, of course, employers have a duty to ev evaluate the existing competence of each employee and determine what training they require. They may need then to, to you know to carry out additional training, look at any shortfalls. The training itself should be adequate and it should be in accordance with a number of nationally recognised training schemes for MUPS. Remember, there's no need to provide approved accredited training, provided whatever scheme you choose, it meets the criteria for what's deemed as being adequate. Um, if you're unsure about what what should be in the core elements of a training for a MUP operator, BS8460, which, uh, 2017, which is the code of practice for the safe use of MUPs, in table two, it gives you them core elements. Um, and obviously that's also covered in terms of other, other sort of ISO documents like 18878, which gives you the the requirements of training operators. Now, familiarization um, or self-familiarization, no matter what training is given, there will always be an element of familiarization necessary, right? Features, capabilities, and of course, where the rescue plan, rescue controls are. Are they, if we take a car, are they near side, are they off side, are they at the front, at the back? Do I need to open a canopy? Do I, do I open a canopy and then what do I do then? Do I turn a lever? Do I operate something? Often, you know, that familiarization um, can be perhaps given by an IPATH demonstrator uh, or by, like some of you, you know, correctly answered earlier, by watching a familiarization film, for, for example, some of the films that we've prov provided. Now, them films that we've provided, which I think we're two years in now, they've been viewed of, you know, there's 40 odd, 50, I think 50 films now that I've done um, and they've viewed, been viewed over 80,000 times now. All right, so statistically, the films that, the, you know, the AFI, Techie Hats, often the amount of time and money that's been spent, 80,000 times these films have been viewed. So, you know, they have no doubt prevented accidents, improved productivity, 
and provided and provided information on how to uh, emerge to a machine you know in an emergency so for the managers and supervisors and, and perhaps owners present here today challenge you uh, to go out and question you know when if, you, if you've got a machine on site you know go and ask what are the rescue arrangements in place what is the plan who is going to rescue that person you know what training and familiarization they've had have they re rehearsed it you, know, you might be surprised at perhaps what the response you get because often i find that you know it's a it's a oh i think the key's down here and i think it's if i turn this lever here and it's a bit it's a bit harrowing and given that you know if you take the the crushing and guy uh, and trapping guidance they do kind of state you've got about seven minutes to rescue a person who's stuck or, or crushed in a in a situation so you may not have long to rescue that person so why do we need a rescue plan then? So rescue planning, um, I might state the obvious here, but clearly there is a, a um, there is a legal requirement, um, and that legal requirement is to have a rescue plan in place. That plan has got to be an emergency plan and a, and for rescue, and there's got to be a set procedure in place for that evacuation. Think about you know, and we always have to think about things which are foreseeable, um, and and make sure employees know what emergency procedures there are. Do never, do not, do never rely on emergency services for your rescue plan. If a situation occurred where the platform cannot be lowered by the operator from the platform using the normal controls, then there needs to be a clear plan in place to overcome that situation. You know, it's too late. You know, what ifs? You know, after I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd looked at that. Um, you know, and there is, you know, if there's nobody there to assist. Um, people may think that you know perhaps you know there's nobody actually you know injured or nobody trapped up in that machine why is the alarm going off what's the reasoning so people who aren't you know haven't been familiarized uh, may often panic and, and you know not be in a position to make a rational decision uh, and you know like I said earlier make the situation far worse now IPAF um, <clears throat> and I do a lot of work with IPAF um, have through their accident reporting system I've identified incidents where there was no one, no one on the ground that knew or was able to lower an injured uh, operator to, in the platform to the ground, and they were in need of urgent medical attention, life-threatening um, attention. So just be just be mindful of that. You know, it, we, it is it is a legal requirement, um, and I'm hopeful that you know <clears throat> any mutes that you've got, you have got a um, a rescue plan. Remember, all these machines are different. Now, if we look at common rescue um, um, problems. Um, Let's face it, we come across all different sites um, and, and many different roles and many different responsibilities. Any site or premise uh, are going to be organic. They're growing, they're changing daily. Machines moving, excavations being dug, trailers being you know, left, produce being stacked, temporary lighting, mutes on different lines. There's loads of things. And you know, I take my hats off to the, some of the, you know, to some of the work that you guys and, and ladies do. Um, but that's why a mute rescue person is should and always should be identified and responsible uh, for people that are needed to react to any situation where which arises. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what duties does that emergency rescue person have? Sometimes we refer to that person as a ground rescue person. Are they solely responsible to sit, stroke, stand, or, or wait for an emergency? Often that's not the case. They often have multiple roles. They often have different duties, um, and they're called upon when you know the proverbial hits the fan. Sadly, unfortunately, situations have occurred where no one actually knew the operator was indeed trapped or, need, or indeed needed help. Um, the machine key should always be in the ground controls unless it's been recommended to be uh, positioned somewhere else by the manufacturer. Um, many MUPs uh, do need the uh, ground key turned from platform to ground controls. However, there are some manufacturers now making it that the emergency controls can be used in either position of where the key is positioned. What if the overload cell has been activated? Um, people think that they can still lower the machine. Um, perhaps maybe the overload cell hasn't been activated by the person. The guardrails have been caught under some steelwork or ducting. The fact is, though, if the overload cell has been activated, um, the machine thinks it's an overload situation, and the normal ground conditions—sorry, uh, the normal ground controls—will not uh, work. And we'll cover that a little bit later on. Um, obviously. We have secondary guarding devices fitted to machines, but not all will prevent crushing and trapping. Some will only sound the alarm that that trap or that crush has, act, has actually um, you know, occurred. So you've then got to work on how to get that down. And it may well be a complicated maneuver to get the platform out into a position on auxiliary, like we mentioned earlier, to, so then we can use the ground controls you know, on full power, full speed to get the down. Um, and again, remembering manufacturers do design um, their ground and auxiliary 
uh, emergency emergency lowering controls in different places. So knowledge and practice of these is paramount. You know, again, I've I've had it before where the machine's been positioned, uh, a mass type boom positioned in place down an aisle. Um, and they've gone to go to use the ground controls to find that they've got to open the canopies to get to the ground control and they cannot open the ground, the canopies because there's pallets of produce ne nearby. So just be mindful of that. Um, so in terms of preventative measures, um, you know, let's think about it. If, we, if we're going to make sure that we, you know, we have a plan in place, we need trained op operators first. You know, are they trained and are they experienced? Have they completed their pre-use checks and function checks? Has it been recorded? <clears throat> Did it include checking the emergency lowering, both ground and platform? Has familiarization been carried out? You know, and is that recorded? Most people record or should record their familiarization in their IPAF logbook. Now I can probably count on my hand the amount of times I've seen an IPAF logbook. The chances are very shortly, and I say shortly, it's um, you know probably sort of a few years away, but we will have a digital way of recording familiarization. Is there a nominated person on the ground? Are they, are they, are they, have they got a different color helmet on? Have they got a sticker on? They've got a different high vis vest on. Who do, who is that ground rescue person? Have they rehearsed that, that process of getting that machine down? If you look at the controls there, that's my hands uh, and a still from one of our familiarization films. You know, it's all right. Just me pushing the levers. You've got to attribute that machine and that boom and that position of the boom to where the machine is and where the operator is. So you've, there's got to be a, a dynamic assessment carried out before you start operating them controls is the key in the ground controls you can see the key on the right hand side there up at the top is there a safe system of work in operation is there supervision can i get to these ground controls can i get the boom down is there something else in my way to prevent my boom getting down and last lastly not but not leastly um, is there a service engineer available because sometimes, you know, I can go to them ground controls and perhaps one of these lights up above or something's happening. You can see the top light there where it shows like a little weight. Um, or oh, sorry, on the top left there of the, of the screen um, in, in the ground control panel, you can see that little weight emblem. If that's flashing, that means that the platform's overloaded. So th there's other aspects there that needs to be considered. So um, a couple of pictures I took off the internet. The first picture on the left shows a stock photo of a manufacturer uh, machine doing exactly as intended you know they are you know not knocking these this manufacturer a lot um, after all they're trying to sell its ability and the machine's versatility and what it's what it's built for however what they omitted to consider on the occasion of this photograph was that the ground controls are situated wall side uh, in other words you wouldn't be able to reach them okay um, so that one on the right hand side there if for example that jib or the upper boom uh, lifted or lowered and made contact with the steelwork then, um, then this could then perhaps then be an overload situation. And that's something I mentioned earlier in, in some of the common rescue um, problems. But what about catastrophic unforeseen events? Let's face it, um, these do occur. And in this situation on a well-known um, video sharing platform, um, it captures the moment and the aftermath of a new used for work on a bridge. And it's been unfortunately struck by a tanker on the main carriageway. Now, as you can see, um, this was catastrophic and it made a huge, um, you know, you know, people unfortunately lost their lives on there. But it then required the rescue of the operators, which were still trapped at height. But in this situation, there is no way able, able to recover them to the normal ground position. Instead, what they had to do then was lower them to a, a waiting rescue boat. Now, remember, situations like this, normally you wouldn't rely on the emergency services. OK, so um, in terms of avoiding trapping, crushing and guidance. Now, when I prepared this webinar, I considered this guidance document, which was prepared you know, some, some years ago now. And I was involved in preparing part two of the document. Uh, and it's been a very, very well downloaded, um, very, very useful document. And it was and it's done exactly as it was uh, as it was designed for. And the document I'm considering here is this document here. Now, I can tell you now it's currently under review as there's been changes to uh, EN 280 2013 um, and of course BS 8460 2017 Code of Practice. So at the moment, I think with this, you know, um, at, um, at the um, a, a myriad of, of, of sort of comments that are being made by uh, industry, 
Um, and these industry questions are clearly going to have to, um, you know, look at, you know, how this document changes. So it's going to be right for the next X amount of years. Just remember that this document itself, the one on the left, freely downloadable. Um, part one is aimed at planners, managers and trainers, uh, while this part two is aimed at the, um, you know, those who are using and supervising uh, mutes. OK, when you look into that document, there's all sorts of aspects of things, you know, trapping and crushing and such. But one of the things, again, it does talk about is, you know, um, control functions and locations. Now, we recently had an incident where a mute was stranded with a person on board uh, due to an overloading situation. The machine in question was a vertical type machine. Um, and what really surprised me, I suppose, post incident, as I was involved with this one, was a supervisor highlighting to me um, and to a, to a number of people at the mute emergency lowering system, they had to turn a valve before the platform would descend. I must say at this point, I thought of that individual, poor individual stuck up in the air. And what had not taken place, clearly there was no rescue rehearsal. Otherwise they would have known the valve required to be turned. No risk assessment that was, you know, um, um, you know good enough for this and no safe system. In truth, I didn't expect the turn of the valve to be known to the supervisor, but I did expect that to be known the ground rescue person and, and clearly it was the ground rescue person who brought this to the attention of, of uh, somebody when unfortunately the machine got stuck up in the air. In another situation that we recently had earlier, um, a genie super boom that we had on hire became stuck at height and the machine had essentially gone out of its own envelope. In this situation all functions stop operating to keep the machine in a safe condition. Now this then requires a trained person on that ground to put the machine into what's called a service bypass or recovery mode. Uh, in trying to lower that machine, they turn the key to service bypass recovery mode, and the machine then followed a predetermined route to basically fold itself up, lowering itself to the ground um, unaided. The operator, once it turns that key, um, or the ground rescue person, once they turn that key, it folds itself up basically. Um, there were further complications at that point in time in that the operators were not English speaking, so language was a challenge. Uh, challenge. Um, now, remember, all manufacturers' manuals, no matter what, are, are available on their respective websites and often in, in, um, in, in the various languages. But be mindful that decals on the machine, like we can see here, are going to be pictorial. Um, but equally, you can see the, the picture on the, on the right. It does have English writing there. So let's not perhaps put any barriers up for people being able to get back down safely. Just mindful I'm working out my computer um, microphone here, so hopefully you can still hear me all okay. OK, um, in terms of um, some of the new ground controls and new uh, controls on MUPES, these were included in the 2013 design of, uh, design of MUPES. Um, and of course, when we're looking at anything in terms of trapping and crushing, sometimes this can have a, a marked effect, right? Because when we're looking at secondary guarding devices, how they work, um, and, and you know, we've got to make sure that we've got somebody that's been um, you know, correctly uh, trained, um, we've got the selection of the appropriate MUPE, the trained operator and, and how they're reset and how do we reset any sort of device and of course the safe use of that. In terms of functionality of the machine, we need to make sure that you know how, how any secondary guarding device is triggered, um, how it's operated and of course how it's, how it's reset and is this included in any pre-use check. Now, again, remember I mentioned earlier, I've done a previous webinar on secondary guarding and probably it may, have, may need to be updated because since I did that webinar, there's been different types of secondary guarding unit devices come out. Um, and again, these are these are basically fitted um, and, and of course implemented by certain um, um, mute manufacturers and of course pushed by uh, principal contracts, etc., to reduce the risk in, uh, of any remaining sort of uh, risk of entrapment. So including the selection of fitter and of an additional secondary guarding device um, then furthers that reduce of perhaps being, um, being trapped. Now, I mentioned earlier about the, um, you know, we do have, I'll, I'll use a, an example that happened not long ago insofar as the fact that once uh, a MUP had got into a, an overload situation. Um, and now in 2013, EN280 um, expressly stated um, and I'm not, I don't sit on that committee, but the, if I take the uh, the beef and the bones of it, basically they said they have to record every time a machine's emergency, emergency uh, auxiliary controls are used. So on this picture here on the ground controls on the left-hand side, 
um, you can see the padlock sign at the bottom uh, under the yellow uh, inside the yellow circle and you can see on the left like a, a picture of a bolt of lightning that's the emergency uh, lowering to turn that machine on with engine all i would do is push that toggle switch up to utilize the ground emergency lowering um, i would pull it down um, which in turn then either does unlocks the controls on my right or activates the emergency lowering now that button on the bottom there which i've circled in red and you can see there also has a padlock sign and for a lot of plant people um and i'm not knocking the manufacturer of this at, at all for a lot of plant people what that looks like is a starter button so unfortunately when people press that um the machine then um has a fault essentially um and needs to be reset which is a bit of an issue in some in some places so the overriding of the emergency stop, um, according to EN280, EN shall only be allowed, for example, um, if, it, if a rescuing a trapped or an incapacitated operator on the platform. So, 2000, um, EN280 2013 goes on to say that safety functions may be overridden to recover the operator when a safety device has been tripped. So, for example, a moment sensing disk system or an envelope system, um, the management system. Overriding of safety function is permitted only by the use of a mode selection device. So what you can see there is that mode selection device there, that big yellow button. And that is independent from the control station selection device. Such a mode selection device is a safety device that shall be operated by a hold to run control. So in other words, I've got to push that button in to make it work. If I take my finger off or my thumb off it, it will stop. Now, this will allow the machine to run at a reduced speed and it will only allow one motion to happen at a time and it must be protected against unauthorized use. So what they've done is they've put it inside a inside a cup essentially there. Features shall be provided to protect against the misuse and overriding and give visible evidence when they've been used or tampered with. Okay, so resetting the feature to the original con condition would then require the use of a tool. So it's either a password or a physical tool. Now with this particular machine, you have to open up the canopy, open up that ground control panel and fit your analyzer to the machine and reset it. However, if rescuing a trapped or an incapacitated operator, it is permissible to override that emergency stop. All right. And that will then allow the motion of the platform sufficient to rescue the platform. So essentially, if that person's been, um, say, for example, we've gone out of envelope or the machine has been pushed up into steelwork. <clears throat> OK, for me to now lower that machine down, I would have to turn, put, uh, turn the key to ground. All right, and I would have to put my finger into that button and then operate that control. But in doing so, on some machines, you actually um, close off all emergency lowering, uh, all safety features of the machine, safety functions. So effectively, you override um, all safety safety features. So if I'm almost out of my envelope, and if you're working with me on this, I push that button, and unfortunately, I tell you out. I could, I am in the position perhaps where I could. Um, unfortunately tip that machine off i could go even further out of my envelope so again knowledge of how them controls work knowledge of how they work and, and, and understanding that the direction in which that boom works is paramount okay um mid-air rescue so if that service te technician is unable to rectify so remember on our on our sort of um circle of uh, you know support uh, you know things in terms of what we need to have service te technician maybe can't get to you maybe there's nothing maybe there's a part they needed maybe it's catastrophic something like this um and a timely repair um may be something that you know has to be ordered from a, from the manufacturer site management then need to be contacted for permission to carry out a, a you know a mid-air rescue and and situations such as this you know sometimes a service technician ain't going to be able to do very much to you there is an immediate risk to health and safety of the occupants in the platform you can see this this is this is life-threatening this is life-ending then and only then should site management be contacted for authorization to carry out the mid-air rescue. If you have a plan for this, what factors must you consider? Who's going to do it? You know, have you got a comparable machine size, height that can enable you to you know to do this? Many things to consider. But if you're looking at a basket-to-basket -basket rescue, then the rescue must have in place the safest position to minimise any additional danger involved you've got to think of things like safe working loads you've got to think think of things like having the smallest gap between the two machines what about double lanyards and anchoring onto the person before they de you know unclip from the machine that they're in what about never overloading <clears throat> the machine that you're actually on and in some in some situations a basket to basket rescue is simply not feasible 
uh, and such as like you saw earlier with the um, with the motorway uh, bridge incident. The only thing you can do then is contact the emergency services. <clears throat> In terms of loan working, it's important to assess loan workers um, and make sure that you know the risk to loan workers are, are minimised. Take steps to avoid any uh, and control any risks. You know, working alone in itself is not prohibited, uh, and often it's very you know it can be safe to do so. But employers have a duty to assess the risks and to take steps accordingly. This may include briefing a nominated person. Um, that person perhaps may be somebody that's working for the shop that you're working in, or somebody you know the store or the or in you know the you know in the in the, in the, in the shopping centre. Um, but somebody who's able to lower that platform using ground and emergency auxiliary controls when necessary. Now, in terms of the uh, the hierarchy, um, within the code of practice, there is a hierarchy. Um, and one of the things that often happens, is it says there is, if the mute stops unexpectedly, it says, do not panic. So that's sometimes a, you know, a, an easy thing to say that. But, you know, we need to make sure the machine hasn't, you know, inadvertently been switched off. You know, somebody's turned it off at ground controls. Check your dashboard, check for the any warning lights and alarms. And if you're the operator, you're going to get the operator's manual and have, you know, a quick look and see if you need to reset anything. Try and start restart the machine. If it cannot be restarted, there may be a battery problem. There may be an engine problem. Use the platform auxiliary controls to lower the machine. And if that's still not working, then you know you clearly need some some method of communication so you can report that problem to your supervisor. Okay. So if the platform um, auxiliary controls are not effective, then you're going to notify that ground rescue person to then activate the pre-planned rescue plan. And you're going to have a sequence um, for lowering the platform, the ground controls. If this, of course, if you are coherent and, and uh, conscious, you can maybe communicate with that person. You know, where possible, you need to maybe retract an extending deck or, you know, um, or a boom to reduce the lowering air required. Hopefully, the operator is in a position where they can verbally relay the process of the descent to the ground rescue person, um, and the nominated ground person then should attempt to use the primary ground controls, so you know the, the ones that power down fastest, or, or yeah, in terms of that, uh, if their rescue plan uh, permits. If then primary ground controls are inoperable, then they're going to re 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 uh, revert to the auxiliary controls and the power source, which should be used to lower the machine to the stowed position. If there is total loss, total failure of ground controls um, and the power sources are unresponsive, um, then you're going to have to contact the, 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 uh, the machine owner rental company immediately. You're going to need to request an estimated time of arrival for their, for their competent person. <clears throat> you're then going to have to assess the position, the condition of the operator and any of the platform occupants. It might be safer, completely safer, to leave them where they are until that assistance arrives. Of course, if assistance is not available in a, in a readable, readable format, then you're going to have to then consider a basket to basket rescue. But again, and that might be something down to weather. It might be something down to, you know, time of the year. You know, again, have they got, you know, you know, materials up there to keep them warm and, you know, um, you know, blankets to keep them warm, you know, thermal, thermal sheets. Uh, quite a common thing in some of the, you know, bigger, big, you know, certainly when you go up, up uh, into the colder areas or, you know, you're going up into sort of a uh, wind farm. Now, if the platform uh, operator is alone and incapacitated, the ground rescuing person should call the emergency service response team. Um, so that would be your, your response team, uh, as specified in the res rescue plan. The ground rescue person should assess the situation, conditions and the platform, you know, and the locations of the surrounding hazards. Don't forget, electricity could be, you know, be a factor here. Uh, and of course, the use of another MUP or an alternative means of uh, lowering that person, if available, may be necessary. And if it's not detrimental to the occupant, then fully lower the machine to the third position. OK, so from a rescue from height position, um, then we need to think about the easiest way. And like I said earlier, the, 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 the scenario there, the descent controls and systems are often specific to an individual machine. But, you know, as such, periodic drills should be required for those who have on-site responsibility. Don't just do them once, do them on different types of machines. You know. Don't have to do it with the person in the platform. The platform can be, you know, elevated up right away to, you know, bring that machine down. Because essentially, you're working on course um, put together for this. But I do know that um, there are considerations for this. Uh, we, as a rental company, have done this before for some sort of uh, 
you know, locations that we've been in. So we've, we've certainly got what we would consider to be an in-house training course for mid-air rescue. Um, but, you know, maybe the industry needs to look at a, um, you know, an, a, an external, um, you know, an accredited approved course. Um, perhaps it's not a big thing. I don't know. But, you know, if it's big enough for IPAF to put together um, a rescue plan um, poster like so under their anti access campaign, it tells you there are issues. So, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm talking out of turn there. I don't know. Right. What I want to show you now is a video. Great video. Of this um, I've got permission to use it from the company. Um, and then we're nearly kind of kind of done for the for the film uh, for the webinar. So okay, what you've got here now is a scenario where um, there is an operator there, and basically he's, he's gone over onto the. Um, onto the controls um, and basically you sound in a sound in alarm and you can see there <clears throat> this is footage taken from um, a handheld ca uh, mobile camera so he's basically he's, he's, he's over the over the control and he's and the alarm is sounding okay his supervisor is here on the left here and walks around to have a look at it probably giving him some grief I don't know the person, so with respect to that person, um, I'll um, you know I'll I'll, uh, I'll stop it there. Um, they're obviously by a core of a of a um, of an area, so he's started now. Just he's gone back to his job. Okay, alarm still going off as you can hear. All right, and the guy's you know obviously he's now thinking in his mind, is there really something wrong with him? I'll have another look. Now I'm going to walk a bit closer. And I'm going to see if there is anything really wrong with him. What you probably saw just when the film started was the operator in the background in the other boom disappear. Now, whether it was disappearing to come down to help or not, I don't know. <clears throat> but now we've now eventually got this guy round to the actual side of the machine. Um, and he's turned the, turned the key from platform to ground. Um, and as you can see, this boom at the moment, it's lower boom or secondary boom is down. And the primary boom is up in the air. Jib's, jib's um, about halfway up. All right, and what he's now going to do is uh, rotate the machine around because in this situation there, we can't lower the primary boom down to the ground because it'll end up hitting the, you know, the uh, the barriers and such there and the concrete. So now he's going to start rotating the machine round. Now this time, it's all time. This, and if you think about these in, in these sort of things, they're all situations where you know hindsight being a wonderful thing. And now you can see the, the turntable rotating, and it's coming down. Now, if you, if I was taking a clock now and timing this, we're probably about two and a half minutes in here now. Um, and on the on the original film, it does actually show the clock in the left hand side at the top. So I'm not 100 percent sure as to why it doesn't show it. Now down he comes, and obviously <clears throat> this was all staged, and th this is this is really really good stuff. You can see the guy lifted his head up there. This is really good stuff insofar as the fact that they are testing their system. Does it work? All right. Does the does the ground rescue person react? Do they do they put into plan? You know what they should have done. You can see he's uh, he's actually quite conscious as the operator there. All right, because he's actually looking up. All right, but you can see there now he's, he's coming down to ground level. OK, and I would suspect at the end of this, there'll be some sort of debrief. Now, that time from that first alarm going off to, to the operator being down was somewhere between four and a half and five minutes. So that four and a half stroke five minutes is time, you know, we can ill afford to take. All right. In terms of that. OK, so in terms of, um, in, in, you know, in terms of getting that person down, it's critical that we get that person down as soon as we possibly can. All right. So Prezi didn't work there. Um, OK, so um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to get all philosophical on you here. You have your own procedures um, and you have your own, um, uh, you know, you have your own plans in place. Um, and you're going to have your own procedures and plans for your safe work in a height. Now, like I said earlier, 
earlier, being part of the accident, uh, the IPAF accident working group, we know from collated data there are numerous occasions where people have been stranded at height. As I said earlier, it's often down to the belief that the operator doesn't think it's going to happen to them. So we've covered training and competence. We've covered, covered why you need a rescue plan and common rescue plan problems, including the trapping guidance, uh, cushion and trapping guidance. Be mindful that's going to change. It's going to get updated shortly. We've looked at some of the controls and functions. Remember, there's different types out there. There are gravity. There are battery. You've got the main power of the machine. There are some machines, and you know, again, go on our go on our weapon familiarization videos and look at some of the track mounted emergency lowering films. Our familiarization videos are split out with the full machine um, familiarization and the separate emergency lowering. Okay, so you can basically get yourself a good idea as to you know what it needs to. Some of the track mounts, and I'm not knocking the track mount manufacturers, they are complex emergency lowering situations. We've looked at mid air rescue and a bit of loan working and, of course, a, a rescue hi uh, plan hierarchy. Now, putting into plan the last video that you've seen there gives you an indication then as to, you know, you know, does the plan work? In truth, that guy should have been down within a, within, within a couple of minutes. Um, and I'm sure there was a, probably a conversation afterwards as to why it took him so long to react. But often it's it's long, you know, it's, it's by wolf, isn't it? You've got to make sure that the reason why it's going off is, you know, it, it is, a, is it life threatening? Do I need to get involved? OK, so thank you for attending. Um, in terms of questions, um, I have got a couple of questions. Um, and. Yeah, Vincent said lost sound again. Look, I think that we can't hear you. All right. Again, you saw I had a bit of a gremlin there something. OK, so I've got a, a question from Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. Should the industry not make the ground controls the same? Um, and I think to be fair, I think that's coming. Um, um, to aid with rescue plans. I think that's kind of coming. I think it's possibly, you know, let's not forget you're going to have a legacy of machines out there that, you know, are going to be, you know, you know, the last sort of, you know, 10, 15 years of machines, they're all going to, I think we're getting closer. I don't think we're not we're there yet. And this has been applied pressure from various groups to try and get them to some sort of common agreement. Um, is it possible to direct us where we can find the video clip? Um, I'm presuming, um, Simon, you mean in this video that I've just shown there? That's um, I don't think that's freely available. If 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 I'm if I'm honest with you, Simon, it's something that was shared with me um, and basically allowed um, so that we could um, you know show it for things like this. Um, it is doing its rounds in the industry. Um, whether or not it's um, um, you know whether it's freely available out there or not, I don't know. Okay, um, right, slightly over. That's because we had that technical issue. But um, you know, thank you to the um, you know the, the the you know still actually quite good attentiveness on there of, of people that's listened. Um, just mindful, of course. You know, you you guys are the, the you guys and ladies are the people doing the job. Is there anything that you would perhaps want a webinar um, prepared for and delivered on? If I can get enough information and, and sort of uh, collaboration to sort of say we'd like a webinar run on that subject. Then yeah, I'll happily, you know, do the research and put a webinar together. Um, all I can offer is my apologies for the uh, the IT today. So it seems to have uh, beat me again. Um, but as you can see, there I had complete total loss of my laptop for um, shut down. But thankfully, I didn't lose you all. And to be fair, I think I only lost one person. So really do appreciate listening today. Um, have a great rest of the week, um, and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much.